Hi guys, my name is Ollie. I'm a junior doctor living and working in England and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Welcome back to my series on medical emergencies for med school and PA school finals as well as for the SFP interviews. In each of these emergency scenario videos there is a feedback form in the description below. If you go and fill that out you'll receive free access to a summary sheet which has everything you need to know from this tutorial and an Anki deck so you can add it to your existing study resources. And one last thing which is that this video is strictly for educational purposes only. It is aimed at finalist medical and PA students to help them through their exams. It should not form the basis of your clinical decision making and is not a substitute for proper training and qualification. But with that out of the way, let's move on. And today we're going to be talking about hyperkalemia. And hyperkalemia, as you will all know, is the state of having too much potassium in your blood from hyper meaning high and kalemia coming from the Latin kalium, which is the old word for potassium. Now, if we think a normal serum potassium is going to be between 3.5 and 5.3 millimoles per litre, the tricky thing is that it's actually possible to sit some distance either side of this range without any noticeable signs or symptoms. But moving forward, it can just be helpful to remember that potassium has many, many functions in the body, including control of muscle contraction and blood pressure. But this actually generates us some problems because potassium has so many different functions and it's possible to sit outside of our normal range without signs or symptoms. This means that by the time we do actually get signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia starting to appear, they can be incredibly non-specific. These might be things like feeling tired, weak, having shortness of breath, palpitations, which they can feel in the chest. As you can imagine, these things are not incredibly helpful um, when we're trying to form a diagnosis. And hyperkalemia is actually most commonly picked up during routine use and ease, uh, urea and electrolyte measurements that are being done for something else entirely. And you come back, you get your lab results back and you think, oh, that potassium's a bit high. We should probably do something about that. But now let's walk through a typical exam scenario together. You are a newly qualified physician associate on the surgical ward. The ward healthcare assistant, Michael, tells you that Mrs. Jones, a 64-year-old lady, is having some mild chest pain and says her heart feels funny. Mrs. Jones has had high blood pressure for the past several days and the nice FY1 doctor prescribed her Ramapril two days ago. You quickly review her latest lab results and note a potassium of 6.2 millimoles per litre. This was noted as being high on the ward round this morning and a repeat sample has recently returned in the last few minutes as 6.4 millimoles per litre. So as ever we have a potentially acutely unwell patient so we should utilise our A to E approach. So you go to assess the airway. Mrs Jones, can you hear me? Oh, yes I can dear, it's just my heartbeat, it's, it's all over the place. So the airway is patent as she is talking to us, but we'll keep engaging her throughout the assessment. Moving on to breathing, her respiratory effort is good, her chest movements appear symmetrical, her saturations are 99% on air, a respiratory rate of 16 with no added breath sounds. Moving on to C for circulation, her pulse is approximately 140 beats per minute and irregular, capillary refill time of 2 seconds, blood pressure of 110 over 68, no obvious murmurs on heart auscultation, you ask for an ECG to be performed and cardiac monitoring to be applied. It is at this stage that you note she has a central line in place as well as a peripheral cannula. Coming on to D, Mrs Jones has remained engaged and alert throughout this ordeal. Her AVPU score would be A and she has a GCS of 15. Her most recent blood glucose measurement was 6 millimoles per litre, pupils are equal and reactive to light, and her temperature is 36.8 degrees. And finally, E for exposure, Mrs Jones is exposed while maintaining her dignity, and there is nothing obvious to note. So then by the time you finish doing your assessment, Michael, the healthcare assistant, has completed an ECG that you asked for, and he hands it to you. The key changes to look for in a suspected hyperkalemia are tall tented T waves, widened QRS complexes, and a prolonged PR interval. And before we move on, it's really important to note that we asked for that repeat sample and that we have the results available. This is important to consider because our first result, the 6.2 millimoles per litre, could have been due to something called pseudo-hyperkalemia. You'll remember that potassium is a predominantly intracellular ion, which means that normally it likes to live in the cells and not in the plasma, which means that when we're bleeding our patients and we're accidentally hemolyzing, breaking up lots of red cells, they are releasing all of this stored potassium into the plasma. 
This is why we have to have at least two separate samples in order to confirm a diagnosis of hyperkalemia. So now it's time to think about our treatment algorithm. The single most important thing we need to do is stabilize the cardiac membrane, and this is done either using IV calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. This raises an obvious question, why are we messing about with calcium when calcium should have no effect on potassium concentration? And the reason is, keeping things really, really simple, is that these calcium ions raise the positive threshold voltage that is needed for our sodium channels in the cardiac membrane to depolarize and fire. Or rather, it reduces the chance, if you like, of our cardiac membrane depolarizing inappropriately and thus going into an arrest rhythm. Obviously check your trust guidelines, but a typical dosing regime might be 30 milliliters of 10% calcium gluconate IV or 10 milliliters of 10% calcium chloride IV. And remember that the effect of these cardiac stabilizing drugs is incredibly rapid. You should have another ECG ready to be performed within one to three minutes. That's how quick these things act and you should start to see reduction of those extreme features, sort of detenting, if you like, of your T waves. Now that we've stabilized the cardiac membrane, the second step is to shunt as much of that potassium as possible back into the cells where it needs to be. The most common way of doing this is with a combination of insulin dextrose, 10 units of ActRapid in 50 milliliters of 50% glucose, the idea simply being that insulin stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase antiporter and that's going to help shunt potassium back into the intracellular space. The other thing you could consider is salbutamol 20 mg via nebulizer or half a milligram 0.5 mg IV. This works in broadly the same way except it's going to stimulate that adenylase cyclase enzyme converting ATP to cyclic AMP which in turn is going to stimulate that ATPase in exactly the same way, shunt potassium across the cellular membrane in exchange for sodium. And then finally the third step is simply to try and get rid of as much extra potassium as possible. The easiest way to do this is using a binder like calcium rhizonium, a typical dose might be 30 grams given orally or per rectum. And this is a resin that simply acts to exchange calcium and potassium ions across the intestinal wall. So essentially you're trying to excrete as much potassium as you can. Two things to be said, the first is give a laxative when you give the binder to improve obviously digestive flow and increase the output of potassium. But the second thing is that this is obviously a very, very slow process. This will take hours and hours to have any measurable effect and it's not going to help you in an acute emergency. If you are really, really worried your patient's very unwell, then hemodialysis will remain the quickest possible way of getting rid of large amounts of electrolytes. Now, the last thing I want to say, guys, is that hyperkalemia is an emergency situation that is dominated more than anything by delivery of drugs. We're not really doing anything procedural here. Obviously, the staple things we're trying to do all depend on getting those drugs in at the appropriate time and at the appropriate rate. Therefore, perhaps more so during this situation than others, it's really, really, really important to utilize closed loop communication. That means that you're giving a task to somebody such as, can you please go and prepare the calcium gluconate and then give it when it's ready. That person also needs to tell you when the drug is ready, when it's been given. It's not really enough simply to have shouted into the ether, please can someone give this, please can someone give that, please can someone give that. You need to really keep your eye on the ball and know which drugs are being given and where you are in the treatment algorithm. And this is because if this all goes south, this person may well go into cardiac arrest. And not only is preventing that arrest an absolute priority, if they do go into arrest, that potassium level is going to be incredibly important as a potentially reversible cause. And whoever the team leader is that comes and takes over from you, they need to know, again, where we are in the overall pathway. So be sure to use good communication practices and practice this when you're prepping for your OSCEs and clinical scenarios. So that's it guys, thank you very much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for more free content just like this. Take care and I'll see you next time.